Ben Shapiro spoke before the House Judiciary Committee to address what he sees as a growing crisis of trust in the media. He argued that legacy media, supported by Democratic legislators and influential organizations, are suppressing conservative viewpoints through informal censorship mechanisms. Shapiro called for Congress to investigate these practices and uphold First Amendment principles. Don't miss. What are the main reasons behind the trust crisis in media, according to Ben Shapiro? How does Shapiro describe the role of brand safety organizations like GARM and media censorship? What actions does Shapiro propose Congress should take to address media bias and protect free speech? Chairman Jordan, Ranking Member Nadler, members of the committee, good morning. First of all, Ranking Member Nadler, I appreciate the kind words about our business. It's very kind of you, and also, I assume that we'd be doing a lot better without the institutional obstacles that I'm about to discuss. First of all, Ranking Member Nadler, I appreciate the kind words about our business. It's very kind of you, and also, I assume that we'd be doing a lot better without the institutional obstacles that I'm about to discuss. Deeply moved by Jerry Nadler's kind words and the respect he has shown, his recognition means a lot, especially in times when we face frustrating institutional barriers that block our progress. Yet, it's in these moments of acknowledgement that we find hope. Mutual respect and understanding can indeed open doors to better collaboration and eventual success. We're in the midst of a trust crisis in the world of media, which is because so many in the legacy media have lied in order to preserve left-leaning narratives. We're in the midst of a trust crisis in the world of media, which is because so many in the legacy media have lied in order to preserve left-leaning narrative. Many viewers feel an overwhelming sense of betrayal by the media. This deep-seated emotion is tied to the confusion and distrust that plague so many. It underscores a desperate need for honesty and truth in journalism. To take just the most recent example, we were told by the legacy media that President Biden was just fine. For years, anyone who questioned his health and mental fitness was trafficking in cheap fakes. And then President Biden went out and engaged in a full-scale mental collapse on stage in front of hundreds of millions of people. So we can see why Americans, at least Americans who are not Democrats, do not trust the media. The question isn't really why the legacy media have lost Americans' trust. We know that answer. The question is why, despite that loss of trust, the legacy media continue to gain share in the advertising market. And the answer is simple. There is, in fact, an informal pressure system created by Democratic legislators, this White House, legacy media, advertisers, and pseudo-objective brand safety organizations. That system guarantees that advertising dollars flow only to left-wing media brands. Let me explain how this works. When a conservative competitor to the legacy media arises, members of that legacy media and their political allies rush to paint such competitors as dangerous. The commentator Kara Swisher of the New York Times, for example, told the head of YouTube that my videos at Daily Wire were a, quote, gateway drug that would lead children, including her own teenage son, to watch neo-Nazi content. Never mind the yarmulke. Elected Democrats pick up that same messaging. In 2017, Senator Dianne Feinstein told lawyers at Facebook, Google, and Twitter, quote, you created these platforms and now they're being misused, and you have to be the ones to do something about it, or we will. Social media companies react to incentive structures, including threats. They have responded by adopting the standards of third-party left-wing informational safety groups like the Global Alliance for Responsible Media, or GARM. GARM purportedly sets brand safety standards, objective standards by which advertisers and platforms can supposedly determine just what sort of content ought to be deemed safe for advertising. In reality, GARM acts as a cartel. Its members account for 90% of ad spending in the United States, almost a trillion dollars. In other words, if you're not getting ad dollars from GARM members, it's nearly impossible to run an ad-based business. And if you're not following their preferred political narratives, the ones that Kara Swisher and Dianne Feinstein would follow, you will not be deemed brand safe. Your business will be throttled. We at Daily Wire have experienced this firsthand. We at Daily Wire have experienced this firsthand. When we infuse personal sensitivity into this issue, it becomes evident that the challenges faced are not just theoretical. They are intensely real, deeply felt, and lived by actual individuals and businesses. Encourage empathy and foster a profound understanding among those who have endured similar hardships so they can spark a sense of solidarity and openly share their battles. In 2017, after Senator Feinstein made her threats to bring the weight of government down on social media platforms, Daily Wire YouTube channel saw a 1,000% increase in content enforcements over a two-year period. Since 2021, after Democrat officials further turned up the heat on social media companies, my personal Facebook page has seen an over 80% drop in impressions. Since 2021, after Democrat officials further turned up the heat on social media companies, my personal Facebook page has seen an over 80 drop in impressions. Connect deeply with your audience by sharing your personal experience of feeling silenced.
This unveils the profound impact that political actions can have on individual freedom and self-expression. The emotional toll of censorship is devastating, stripping away one's voice and leaving a lasting scar. Or take Joe Rogan. When Joe said that he had taken ivermectin after getting COVID, White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki pressured Spotify to take action, stating, quote, we want every platform to be doing more to call out missing disinformation while also uplifting accurate information. Spotify complied. Spotify, of course, works with Garm. So what are the brand safety standards that Garm uses? The standards begin with inarguable things that we've heard from the other witnesses, like preventing distribution of child sexual abuse material or stopping terrorism. But GARM doesn't draw the line at what is criminal, abusive, or dangerous. Their standards also include restrictions on hate speech, harassment, misinformation, or my personal favorite, insensitive, irresponsible, and harmful treatment of debated, sensitive social issues. Those criteria are highly subjective in theory, and they are purely partisan in practice. For example, last year, Daily Wire host Matt Walsh was fully demonetized on YouTube, a GARM member. Why? For quote-unquote misgendering, which to Garm is to say that men are not women. Perfectly obvious facts now run afoul of Garm's censorship standards. Companies targeted by Garm, like The Daily Wire, Breitbart, Fox News, and so many others, reach hundreds of millions of people with opinions and beliefs long established as within the mainstream of American conservative thought. The companies targeted by Garm, like The Daily Wire, Breitbart, Fox News, and so many others, reach hundreds of millions of people with opinions and beliefs long established as within the mainstream of American conservative thought highlight the authenticity and diverse nature of perspectives to foster a strong sense of community and shared identity. This reinforces its significance and worth in the broader social conversation by affirming the audience's beliefs. Garm and its members have no respect for the beliefs of those people. They would like them marginalized or squashed. They would like them marginalized or squashed. Imagine the voice under siege, silenced by an invisible force. An overwhelming sense of injustice stirs within, igniting a flame of urgency. This isn't just an attack on a voice, it's an attack on our very right to be heard. Can you feel the weight of this oppression? Our voices, our expressions, our very essence are being stripped away, bit by bit? We must rally together, fueled by a shared sense of fairness and an unyielding determination. We must resist this alienation, stand firm, and protect our right to speak, to be heard, to exist, it's time to stand up for the First Amendment in this Congress. It's time to stand up for the First Amendment in this Congress. This rallying cry stirs the spirit of the First Amendment, a cornerstone cherished by Americans, resonating deeply within their hearts. It invokes a profound sense of duty, stirring patriotic fervor, and ignites a passionate call to action. It beckons each individual to stand up, united in the steadfast defense of our cherished freedom of speech. Congress can do so in two ways. First, Congress must investigate the informal and perhaps formal arrangements between censorship cartels like GARM and executive branch agencies. The Daily Wire has already filed a federal lawsuit against the State Department for allegedly doing just this. Second, Congress can itself stop engaging in violation of free speech principles. Two weeks ago, writing a dissent in Murphy v. Missouri, Justice Alito condemned what he called sophisticated and coercive government campaigns against free speech. Members of this committee have engaged in precisely such campaigns. When Congressman Schiff speaks about targeting social media companies that must be, quote, pulled and dragged into this era of corporate responsibility because they are too tolerant of misinformation, he knows what he is doing. He is participating in a sophisticated coercive campaign against free speech. When Congresswoman Jayapal blames social media for placing America at the, quote, precipice of a democratic crisis and calls on them to target they deem hate groups, she also knows what she is doing. She is participating in a sophisticated coercive campaign against free speech. When Congressman Hank Johnson says, quote, we need a constitutional amendment to allow the legislature to control the so-called free speech rights of corporations, he also knows what he is doing. We all know what these government actors, what some people in this room are doing. You're using the tacit threat of government action to compel private companies to throttle viewpoints you don't particularly like. The First Amendment was not designed to enable workarounds by elected official. It was directed at Congress, at you, and you're abdicating your fundamental duty when you exert pressure on private companies to censor speech. Some in this room have been doing just that for years. We in the non-legacy media have been feeling the effects. In the name of the Constitution and the name of democracy, this should stop. In the name of the Constitution and the name of democracy, this should stop. Evoking the deepest principles of American identity, the Constitution, and democracy itself, this issue stands as a profound threat to these sacred values. It's not just a concern, it's a call to action. The very essence of who we are is at stake, urging everyone to come together, recognize the gravity of the situation, and fiercely defend our rights. Ben Shapiro, speaking before the House Judiciary Committee, expressed concerns about a severe trust crisis in the media.
He attributed this distrust to the legacy media's maintenance of left-leaning narratives, which erodes public trust, particularly among non-Democrats. Shapiro cited the portrayal of President Biden's health as an example of media misinformation. Despite this mistrust, Shapiro noted that legacy media continues to dominate the advertising market due to an informal pressure system involving Democratic legislators, the White House, legacy media advertisers, and organizations like the Global Alliance for Responsible Media, GARM. This system ensures advertising dollars mainly go to left-wing media brands. Shapiro explained that conservative media, including his own Daily Wire, faces significant challenges due to this pressure system. He mentioned that legacy media and political allies label conservative outlets as dangerous. For example, YouTube was urged to restrict Daily Wire content, accusing it of being a gateway to extreme content. Additionally, elected Democrats have threatened social media companies with government action unless they censor certain viewpoints, leading to increased content enforcement against conservative media. Shapiro cited Joe Rogan's case, who faced pressure for discussing controversial COVID-19 treatments, as an example of this biased censorship. He criticized Garm's brand safety standards as highly subjective and partisan, targeting conservative views on issues like gender identity. Shapiro urged Congress to defend the First Amendment by investigating the relationships between censorship cartels and executive agencies. He also called on Congress to avoid pressuring private companies to censor speech, describing such actions as a sophisticated campaign against free speech. By addressing these issues, Shapiro emphasized the need to protect diverse viewpoints and ensure that media and advertising markets remain free from partisan influence. His testimony highlighted the broader debate over media bias, free speech, and the government's role in regulating information. Ben Shapiro's testimony is a call to defend the fundamental right to free speech against left-leaning bias and government overreach. This is crucial for maintaining a healthy democracy and protecting diverse perspectives, which foster individual authenticity and growth. Shapiro argues that conservative voices are systematically marginalized. Freedom of speech, the cornerstone of democracy, faces threats from both informal pressures and official actions. It is vital to uphold the First Amendment against media bias and excessive governmental power. Shapiro's argument emphasizes the importance of allowing individuals to express their views freely. Censorship's psychological impact on both individuals and society must be analyzed. For democracy to flourish, it needs true dialogue and personal growth through diverse voices and perspectives. Suppressing dissenting views harms an individual's quest for truth and meaning. Media prejudice and censorship erode public trust and cause mental harm, leading to feelings of alienation and helplessness, which exacerbate political polarization and social anxiety. Advocating for a balanced and transparent media environment that respects diverse opinions and promotes healthy discussions is essential. Public reactions to Shapiro's remarks can shed light on trust in media and government institutions. Investigating how bias and lack of transparency weaken public trust, along with the psychological desire for fairness, is necessary. To restore trust, both media and government must uphold principles of responsibility and free speech. Effective leadership and clear communication are crucial in addressing concerns about media bias and censorship. Leaders must foster a culture of openness, respect for free speech, and transparency in their actions and motivations, thereby restoring trust and promoting a more neutral and democratic society. What do you think?